Hello and welcome to Controversies in Church History, the podcast which takes you through all the most important and well, controversial, but also interesting events in the history, the long history of the Roman Catholic Church. Hello, my name is Derek Taylor. Thank you for uh, tuning into the podcast. Uh, if you like what you hear here, go and subscribe on Anchor or Spotify or iTunes or pretty much any other platform you can think of to the podcast. You can go, sub, uh, please subscribe on YouTube. We have a YouTube channel where we put the audio up for you. Uh, also check out the um, our, our website, churchcontroversies.com, and uh, Facebook page. Like us on Facebook, uh, Church Controversies in Church History. Thank you guys again, and uh, this is our final episode, episode seven in our series on Catholic liberalism, uh, episode seven, Assessing the Legacy. So to recap, we'll start by recapping. If you missed all these, all the rest of these, the six episodes, uh, Catholic liberalism was a movement within the 19th century church. Um both a religious movement in terms of trying to push the church in a certain direction, but also among theologians, uh, which, you know, was driven by the apologetic need to appeal to modern society. It begins in the early 19th century with certain thinkers like um, the Abbe de la Manet, who want the church to give up its legally privileged position in France, uh, with the idea that... Um, if the church gives up its legal privileges, it'll have more influence over modern people. Uh, that hence the term liberal. If we if we give people their freedom to choose the church instead of making it de facto, people will come back. And um, of course, he's condemned. Uh, some of his followers carry on in a slightly altered matter. Um, Charles Montalembert and, and only La Cordaire in France, Belgium. There's a Belgian uh, liberal movement, Catholic movement in Belgium, other places. But then things get swamped under in the 1850s and 60s by the upheavals of the century, by nationalism, by the drive for Italian and German unification. And more or less in the 1860s and 70s, the church sort of turns its back on this idea with the Syllabus of Errors in 1864 and with Vatican I. However, it still has influence at the end of the 19th century in theological circles and to a lesser extent in some, in some um, social movements as we've, uh, um, as we've cataloged here, uh, particularly with uh, Pope Leo XIII, who actually tries to get Catholics in France to embrace the Third Republic and try to use its constitution to, you know, again, re-influence society, which does not work. Uh, and of course, we ended last time with the, the condemnation of Americanism, which is this sort of tendency among American Catholics to exalt uh, their society um, and uh, as a sort of perfect uh, result, the church there as a sort of perfect example of how the church should engage the modern world. Uh, and so we come to the end, with the end of well, the end, the final separation of church and state well, in 1905 in France is how we ended. So this one, this this episode is about okay, accessing its influence after that period, and again, that apologetic drive. I mean, you can. This is really still the default today that the church has to adapt the faith in some ways to you know to reach. Modern society has never gone away. Uh, the dom this is the dominant mode of apologetics today. Just the person that automatically comes to mind is um, Bishop Robert Barron. This is his whole shtick. Yes, of course, you know the the church its faith is totally compatible with modern society, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, that sort of thing. And so you can see it there. Theological liberalism has never gone away. Um, it's still influential. Although one of the reasons I wanted to do this series is uh, I think it's confused a lot with modernism. They're not the same things. I go through that in the first episode, and I'll reiterate this difference here in a minute, but liberalism is, is a lot more um, ambiguous. Modernism is, is if a, of itself a heresy. Um, there's no form of modernism that's not opposed to the faith. Uh, it's almost diametrically opposed. It's a lot more straightforward in some regards. Um but there are aspects of Catholic liberalism. That, again, the idea that you adapt certain parts of the faith to try to reach people, we've always done that. The church has always done that. The trick is, okay, what parts of the faith? 
that's the problem with Catholic liberalism, really, is it doesn't spell out because certain things can't be adapted. And then finally, one of the things about that 19th century movement that I still think influences the church today, and it did after 1905, is Lamanet's idea that not only would, if the church gave up its privileges, if it adapted a modern philosophy, you know, got rid of its scholasticism, that was a main uh, thing with him and 19th century Catholic liberals, not only would it, you know, would the church be revitalized and people would come back to the faith, but society itself would be regenerated. Remember, um, I quoted a letter of his in an earlier episode where he said, oh, we, are, we tremble before liberalism? Oh, well. Uh, Catholicize it and society will be reborn. That idea that the church giving up, you know, adapting its faith is the key to social flourishing, I think has a real long shelf life all the emphasis in the modern church on social justice. And even before that, if you're thinking you probably listen to this, you're probably more traditional as a Catholic, uh, I think you can see the influence of, of Catholic liberalism in things like um, the social kingship of Christ, if you're familiar with this. This is the idea that you're going to go, you know, that Christ is the king of all the world, society. You go take the church and its beliefs into society. Uh, that definitely, uh, I think. That, I think. I think. Nineteenth century liberalism influences the idea that, you know, um, um, the idea that the church uh, should go and influence modern society that way, even if it becomes something very different under Pius XI. He's the one who, who promulgates the, uh, um, um, the feast of, of Christ the King to announce that ideal and that doctrine. Uh, like it owes something to to Lamennais and his followers. And you can also see it, by the way, in the deviations of the, of the modern church, because just think about it. I mentioned in the first episode, I was trying to distinguish between Catholic liberals in the 19th century and modern progressive Catholics, right? Progressive Catholics, by that I mean people who, you know, they embrace abortion rights and all of this stuff. But think about what that is, right? The, the modern, you know, heresies or whatever, if you want to say that deviations from the faith are not, you know, people rejecting the Trinity or the Incarnation, it's social doctrines they reject on abortion, on contraception, on stuff like that. And so that emphasis on a social Catholicism, I think, is still very much with us. But the other way I think you can see the legacy of 19th century Catholic liberals still with us, um, the ghost of Lamanet, if you like, is um, in the era leading up to and in Vatican II. Uh, I mentioned how there wasn't a lot of talk about, um, there wasn't a lot of uh, Catholic liberal, uh, excuse me, uh, theological liberalism articulated in the church after after the modernist crisis. Um, but in the 1930s, some people did start to dabble in some of these old, older Catholic liberal themes. The most important person in this, in this regard is, is not a, was not a clergyman, he was a layman, and that's Jacques Maritain, um, the um, French, French philosopher, convert from atheism, he, um, um, Martin was a, was a Thomist, and actually in his Thomism itself, he was fairly traditional, but uh, on things like church-state relations, attitude towards other religions, stuff like this, he took a sort of Catholic liberal line. I wrote a book in 1936 called Integral Humanism, in which basically he's trying to get basically wants the church to sort of try to purify, if you like, modern secular humanism by giving it a Christian dimension. And this meant embracing things like liberal democracy, religious freedom, et cetera, et cetera, a neutral state. Again, this is very much um, an updated version of Lamanet's ideas. Uh, again, different. There's some differences, important ones, because Lamanet was not a Thomas. That's the hugest, biggest difference. But um, he wants to use that the church to, and again, he's thinking of this, by the way, stuff in the 1930s as this, 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 you know, Christian humanism that he's proposing as an opponent of things that have changed, not only of communism, but also of Nazism. And, uh, he writes an article in 1939 where he explicitly lays this out. It's his, it's his answer to both the overweening rationalism and irrationalism of modern life, but he has some of the same goals. Um, I'll read a quotation from this 1939 article here. Um, yeah, uh, he's talking about his integral humanism. He says, quote, On the social significance of such a humanism, I will simply say that in my opinion it should assume the task of radically transforming the temporal order. 
a task uh, which would tend to substitute for bourgeois civilization and for an economic system based on the fecundity of money, not a collectivistic economy, but a personalistic civilization and a personalistic, in quotation marks, economy, through which would stream a temporal refraction of the truths of the gospel, unquote. Uh, to me, this is, this is Catholic liberalism. The, this is the idea if we just, if we give up, um, you know, direct control, the church tries, tries not to, uh, tries not to exercise direct control over society, but an indirect one. Uh, again, the faith will, will flourish, and it'll it'll sort of transform the temporal order. That's very much, uh, to me, in line with Lamane. Uh, and so he's a major, and he's a major figure. I've talked about him in other episodes. He was very influential on things like. Um, um, you can go back and look at it. Uh, look at our uh, episode on or our series on liberation theology. He had an influence there. Uh, he also had a major influence on, uh, influence on Vatican II because one of his friends and one of his former students with, uh, would be Giovanni Montini, the future Paul VI. Uh, he also had a wide influence, did Marquetin, on post World War II Christian democratic parties in Europe, which, again, they reached out, they worked with, you know, Protestant. You know, uh, clergy and Protestant uh, Protestant parties in places like West Germany and Italy and, place, uh, and other places to help rebuild Europe after World War II. That all goes back to Marquetin. Um Theological liberalism also had a, had a big influence on the uh, a group of thinkers that emerged in the nineteen late nineteen thirties forties uh, called the Nouvelle Theologie. Um, hugely important group of thinkers. Um, they eventually are going to, well, I actually could probably do a series on them eventually, but they were directly influenced by Maurice Blondel, who we talked about in the last episode, his, you know, his apologetics of imminence. They were very much, uh, into that sort of thing. Um, but they were also in, they were also mo not all of these, but most of these thinkers, a lot of them were Jesuits, but even some that weren't, uh, had a real anti-scholastic streak in them. They shared that 19th century Catholic liberal idea that, Scholasticism's, you know, too outdated, it's too old, it's too old-fashioned, it's not up-to-date, we need to update Christian theology, it was a big thing with them, uh, and they will successfully displace scholasticism after the council, so, and they will come back to that, but that they're definitely influenced by this. Uh, the worker priest movement. I just talked about this in, on, in the series on liberation theology in the 1940s. Um, this attempt to a priest to go into, you know, the the factories and reach the industrial workers. Again, this all this definitely goes back to, again, this drive to, you know, to 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 encounter those parts of modern society that are new and novel and that the church didn't have any experience with. Almost certainly, I think you can see the influence of 19th century Catholic liberalism there. But above all, it's Vatican II, um, because these ideas, uh, again, through some of those theologians I've already mentioned, are going to get embraced uh, at Vatican II. Really, Vatican II is the triumph in some ways, the posthumous triumph of Catholic liberalism. Um, you can see this in Dignitatis Humanae, which, of course, they wanted to try to give some, some legitimacy um, to, uh, to religious liberty. Uh, but also Lumen Gentium, which, again, one of the things 19th century Catholic liberalism wanted to do was, uh, especially toward the end in Germany, was like there was this, this uh, you know, wanting to distance itself from the centralization of Roman authority. But above all, Gaudium et Space, which is the church's uh, declaration on the church in the modern world, which is almost a love song to the modern world, uh, is about as, I think, I think Ratzinger, Joseph Ratzinger at one point described this as, Sort of, some people thought, saw guiding that space as a sort of counter syllabus, as if it reversed the 1864 syllabus of errors. And I mention this because a lot of times you have people, and again, I did a whole series on Catholic traditionalism. You know my sympathy with it. Um, a lot of times, traditionalist thinkers will sort of, you know, target. Well, this was modernism in Vatican II, and this was modernism here. And um, I don't think that's actually the case. I think modernism is a pretty clearly heretical thing. You can tell that pretty easily. When, Because, um, again, I'll give me an example. One of the key theses in modernism is we can't have any real knowledge of uh, eternal truths or immutable truths. There's no immutable doctrines. Doctrine just changes all the time. That's pretty clear. 
a theological liberal doesn't necessarily say anything. It doesn't entail that. Theological liberalism doesn't necessarily entail those things. There are things that are heretical about theological liberalism, but your run-of-the-mill run Catholic liberal doesn't believe that. Um, this is um, this, but this there is this ambiguity in Catholic liberalism we talked about. They want to adapt things, and that's the problem with it. They never spelled out what they wanted to adapt. And this is, in fact, it gets into the council itself. John Tony Third, in his opening speech, gave a famous speech. I don't have it in front of me, but he made he talks about wanting to update the church again to reach the modern world. Talks about how the the meaning or the substance of the church's teaching is one thing, but its presentation is another. This idea that you can have the same ideas but present them in a different way that is, in in large part. Um, uh, you know, something you could get, go back to La Monet, right? We want to keep the same doctrine, but we want to have a different philosophy, right? We want to have a different, scholasticism is just dead. We need to have a different philosophy. And there are several problems here. And I mention this because, again, some traditionalist scholars I, I really respect point to that speech and and claim that it, it represents a sort of victory for the sort of neo-modernists that have sort of gathered around the council, um, because in modernism, one of the ideas that's that's um, that's um, key to modernistic thinking is that the idea that language, human language, can never capture reality perfectly, and therefore, whatever you know, whatever expressions, whatever linguistic concepts we use to describe something in one era, will not be applied to another. In other words, it's the relativistic view of language and and how human beings can't really come to sort of you know definite truths about things. And again, some of those scholars want to point to the speech and say, hey, this is a victory for modernists. And um, I, I don't think, I don't, I, 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 I'm certain that's not true. Because again, there's this, there, there's a sense in which that, well, the thing about that phrase is it's ambiguous. If you go look at his speech, it can mean, it could mean that, but it can also mean the run of the mill, older Catholic liberal idea that, hey, we just, we just want to sort of, you know, um, adapt certain things. Um, to reach modern people. We don't necessarily want to change the faith. And it's that ambiguity that allows, uh, uh, the ambiguity, I think, of Catholic liberalism that allows people who do have more modernist ideas to, in the council itself and then afterwards, insinuate some of their ideas. Because again, that's one of the things people struggle with, right? Is how could a, a Catholic ecumenical council how how could it, how could it fail so spectacularly as it has, and that's basically. It. But I think it's not the triumph of modernism. But I think it's mostly the triumph of this Catholic liberalism, um, and it's also the triumph of um, you know um, again a certain ideal of what the church should be, which again goes back to these these nineteenth century liberals, and it's it's interesting to, to note. I mentioned. Um, I mentioned some other thinkers on the uh, um, leading up to the council who influenced. I want to read this this uh, part of a lecture, a brief couple of uh, quotations because this is this is fascinating here. I'll give you an idea where I'm going with this. This is a, a lecture from 1958, young theologian who's going to be influential at the council, and he's talking about how Europe is basically becoming uh, is no longer being becoming Christian. Right. Um, let me read a couple of quotations. This so-called Christian Europe for almost 400 years has become the birthplace of a new paganism, which is growing steadily in the heart of the church and threatens to undermine her faith from within. The outward shape of the modern church is determined essentially by the fact that, in a totally new way, she has become the church of pagans and is even constantly becoming even more so. She is no longer, as she once was, a church composed of pagans who have become Christians, but a church of pagans who still call themselves Christians. It's a pretty harsh statement, right? One other thing from this statement, this is this, this speech here, talking about how the church has become pagan, and one of the things this, um, this speech is arguing for is for the church to give up, again, its legal privileges, its place in society. And the reason why is, well, I'll show you this in a minute, this t uh, thinker goes on to say, in the quote, I'm quoting in the quote in the long run, the church cannot avoid the need to get rid of part by part the appearance of her identity with the world, and once again to become what she is, the community of the faithful. Unquote. Let me explain that. What he's talking about here is by having the church 
allied with state power, it looks like it's part of the world. It looks like, uh, you know, um, any other sort of state. Power is sort of a state power or, you know, worldly power is polluting. And if we get rid of that, he goes on to say, quote, actually her missionary power can only increase through such external losses. Only when she ceases to be a cheap, foregone conclusion when she begins to show herself as she really is. Will she be able to reach the ear of the new pagans with her good news? Um, etc., etc., etc. Um, and, uh, the thinker who wrote these words in 1958 was Joseph Ratzinger. And I bring that up because a lot of times I've heard, I've heard, again, this is, you know, it was somebody on the internet, so, <laughs> but I heard someone once, you know, refer to Ratzinger as saying, well, he was basically a modernist. And um, again, this is a confusion. Guy was never a modernist. But he says things like that that almost sound kind of like he's a... It's weird because he's, because he's talking about when he says the church is a church of pagans, he means the people's in the pews in 1958, not just the people outside who are no longer practicing. Again, there's this... Again, this there's this tendency in Catholic liberalism to see people who are already practicing as being sort of not real Christian because they haven't reached this, this very high ideal they have for them. I mentioned Ratzinger because, it, again, that same, that same notion is there. If the church just gives up this, adapts to that, it will, you know, its missionary endeavors will take off. And, of course, that was, that was the idea that the church, you know, that's what Vatican II meant to do. If we just, you know, eschew, you know, direct power over society, I guess, then the people will come in flocking back. And um, it's also after Vatican II, of course, this, you know, um, there was this sense that, of course, that that the older view, of course, that the church, you know, that the state should recognize the church as the true faith, give it support, that it was connected to scholasticism, and it was basically obliterated within a few years of the council. And so you have, you know, the triumph of Catholic liberalism, really, posthumously, um, which, of course, didn't work. <laughs> the thing that people left the church in droves right after the council. And again, part of this, um, part of this, you know, this chaos that happened, how you get these, you know, all of a sudden these ideas that are totally contrary to the faith being almost immediately after the council, all of a sudden people feel free to sort of, to promote them from within the church. It goes back to, I think, the naivete of people like Rotzinger, that's why I mentioned that. You know, when he says, when he says adaptation, I don't think they, they didn't, I don't think they thought through people like Rotzinger. Later on, people like Jean Donielu, who's one of these Duvel theologians who, and you can tell the ones who, who didn't think this through, because after the council was over, they freaked out. Uh, there was a freak out. Ratzinger, uh, Maritain, Jacques Maritain was the great you know, philosopher of the council. Within two years, he wrote a book uh, at the end of the council called The Peasant of the Garonne, in which he basically just, just he basically went off. Um, he said there's a chapter in that book called uh, Kneeling Before the World, which is what he thought was happening after, after the council, even though his ideas inspired it. Uh, I don't think they understood where their, what direction their ideas could be taken in, is my point. Um, these Catholic liberal ideas, because they're so ambiguous, could be taken in modernist directions. Uh, and so I think you can, you, can, you can delay some of the criticism at their feet for that. But the ones who realized they'd made a mistake... And they didn't put it in those terms. People like Ratzinger, uh, um, Henri de Lubac, Anversa von Balthasar. Um, they, they basically separated from their older confreres who were apparently okay with all this. Um, and so uh, the, the legacy of, again, the, and the legacy of Catholic liberalism is itself ambiguous because some of the things that Lamine and his followers did were good. Again, I can't stress this enough to go back to his his first book he published on indifference in 1817. You know, one of the things Catholic liberals understood really clearly is that you do have to, if you're a Catholic, and this is a t this is a tenuous thing. This is a thing that you need know, to be careful with. This the church has to appeal to secular elites. Why? Because those secular elites can, <laughs> if they want to, they've got a lot of power. They can really harm the church. Um, to, it's one thing to say, okay, we have to believe in things like miracles, you know, chastity, stuff like that, but the mock us, but it doesn't mean you can't present your philosophy, the church's theology in a stupid way or a thoughtless way. 
if you don't measure up intellectually intellectually to them, you will, they will never take you seriously. Um, this is one of the reasons why, to this day, if you, again, modern progressive Catholics seem obsessed with you know placating um, secular elites um, in a way that sometimes you know um, conservative traditional Catholics think is kind of craven and cowardice. Well, yeah, I mean, they, they are in a way, but they're not wrong. They're not wrong. There is no, there is no good coming of being ignorant of modern ideas, uh, of not at least having an answer for them. And I've met some Catholics who think that basically they don't have to. I'm like, I, again, if you're gonna, if you're going to try to reach these people, you do need to have, uh, uh, you know, uh, some grasp of it, and you need to, you do need to appeal to those to those people to a certain degree, not to the point of again changing the irreformable aspects of the faith. And this comes back to one last thing, is that, um, you know, Lamanet himself complained that the Church hadn't hadn't made clear, okay, which parts are divine and, un- and therefore, you know, unchanging of the faith and which parts are human. He wasn't being totally fair, but, again, the Church has sometimes not been clear about those sorts of things. In the 19th century, you had all those, those really extreme ultramontane thinkers talking about papal authority, papal, like, temporal authority, like the papal states, as being part of the immutable teaching of the church. It isn't, by the way. Um, so, again, that leads to confusions when you when you attribute more authority to church teachings than they actually have. And so there were a lot of excesses that sort of fed into this. Um, but suffice it to say that the history of the modern church is sort of, the, in some ways, the turning away from Catholic liberalism in the 19th century, then all of a sudden turning and embracing it in the 1960s. And it's kind of funny, sometimes people have pointed out about the, the, about the Second Vatican Council that the Church wanted to engage the modern world, but by the 1960s, the modern world was changing so rapidly, it was coming a postmodern world, right? I don't know about post, postmodern being a real thing, but it's certainly the case that all of a sudden, if you look at Vatican II, it, looking at its documents always confused me. It felt like it was a little bit like they were addressing questions that nobody was talking about in the 1960s. Uh, I have learned a lot anyway from doing this series on on these 19th century thinkers that it feels like the people at Vatican II were really responding to earlier battles, fighting old battles that had already been lost. Um, they wanted to, you know, we finally got a chance to try out the great Lamanet, and Lamanet was great in a lot of ways. He did good things for the church, even if he went off in, in you know bad directions. Same thing with Von Dolinger. Did good work for the church before he, you know, went off the rails. Um, but it seemed like, uh, to me, it was a dated attempt to undo some things that had already been done. It's probably one of the reasons why it didn't succeed the way people thought it would. Um, but it also shows you again how much people have invested in these ideas. Because I say this because if, if I'm correct that Catholic liberalism has been a big failure, that's a problem. Because, you know, it, it's not going back to any time. There's no going back to, in Western societies anyway, to a place where most states, are, they're not going to recognize the church as a state religion. So what do you do now? Um, uh, it it kind of leaves us in a, in a quandary, uh, uh, the church, at this point. And it's amazing, by the way, how much these debates still resonate, these 19th century debates. One last thought, and we'll finish up here. Um, there's recently published an exchange in the conservative magazine First Things between Ross Douthat, who was a New York Times columnist, Catholic, and Edmund Waldstein, who was a, uh, a monk, but also a, a Catholic integralist. Again, someone who takes the position that, you know, the teaching on the church being the true faith and it needing to be recognized by the state is something that we should work for. And if, if you have to subscribe to, to, to read this stuff, but if you subscribe to it, it's amazing. It's almost the same arguments that people were having in the 19th century. Dow thought argues for a resurrection of Maritain's ideas. Uh, Wallenstein, you know, says basically the opposite. It's pretty, pretty interesting. Pretty interesting they're still having these types of debates because uh, things aren't clear still. Um, sometimes, you know, it takes a long time for doctrines to develop, for the church to try to you know, adjust the things, I suppose. Um, um, but we're still living, I think, both with the successes and the failures, definitely the failures 
of 19th century Catholic liberalism today. And so that is all. This is the last episode. Uh, I want to thank everyone again for listening. Really appreciate it. Listeners, please, if you would, go out, you know, email one person. If you really like this, hey, this is a great podcast. You'll learn a lot about church history here. Please go out and tell people about the podcast so we can spread the word and, and grow our audience. And um, again, um, like us on Facebook, go visit our website, churchcontroversies.com. I have a new article in Crisis Magazine coming out, a link to it there and on the Facebook page. But also you can follow us on Twitter, uh, subscribe on YouTube and whatever podcast platforms you like. Uh, oh, yes, and upcoming episodes. Um, just a few notes. Probably no series for a while. The summers, uh, uh, I'll be teaching during the summer. I have some other things I'm doing. I will be doing some standalone episodes, at um, least two or three, and they'll be um, they'll be based on. Uh, they're actually connected to this series because I have <laughs> I have I have material left over from the research I did. So there'll be a couple of those coming up. There'll also be a couple of episodes of the um, um, Catholic Live series. We'll do some mini biographies of some uh, sort of lesser known Catholic uh, Catholics from history. And then a special episode as well, um, as you'll see, uh, a more personal nature coming up uh, uh, as well in the coming months. So be on the lookout for all that stuff. And again, God bless you all. Hope you guys have a great week. May he keep you in his peace and his mercy and, uh, and uh, keep you guys healthy and on the right path. Take care, everybody. God bless.